The French Empire was one of the most powerful in human history. At its height, it controlled almost 10% of the world's land area. From Southeast Asia to West Africa, the country we today associate with baguettes and cinema was a dominant global power. And that was particularly true in Africa. France oversaw territory spanning 17 modern-day nations, from Morocco to the Congo. Under the banner of a civilizing mission, France oversaw brutal occupations that engorged the wealth of the empire and left a terrible legacy for ordinary Africans, marked by slavery, extraction, and murder. And today, France's empire in Africa is still around, in a streamlined, more profitable, and even more exploitative form. Let me explain. In the aftermath of the Second World War, there was a wave of decolonial movements sweeping across Africa and Asia. And the French, humiliated by their defeat and occupation at the hands of the Nazis, were eager to maintain their empire. So they responded to revolts in Algeria, Indochina, and Madagascar with brutal reprisals. Maintaining foreign holdings became increasingly difficult. By 1960, France was forced to grant independence to almost all its colonies. But something really important happened in Africa. Basically, the leadership of France decided to keep their empire in Western and Central Africa intact in everything but name. The plan was simple. When an African country gained its independence, it was made to sign a so-called cooperation agreement with France, which would outline the nature of their relations moving forward. In exchange for French foreign aid, African countries were required to give France rights over natural resources, allow France to maintain troops in their territory indefinitely, and, most importantly, keep these countries' currencies linked to France's currency, the franc. Instead of having their own currency, they were to use the franc of the financial community of Africa, what is now called the CFA franc. The French framed these cooperation agreements as a choice, but they were also clear about the consequences of defiance. When the leader of Guinea, a socialist named Sekou Touré, rejected the cooperation agreement with France and declared that he preferred to be poor in freedom than rich in slavery, the French government decided to make an example of him. They cut all foreign aid to Guinea and did everything they could to destabilize the government. They launched a secret campaign to print fake Guinean banknotes and flood the country with them. One French spy later bragged, the operation was a total success. Guinea's economy, already very weak, never fully recovered. The French said that these countries existed within the so-called French community, but the policy would come to be known more widely as France Afrique. It was about having the former colonies in a position that was maximally advantageous to French interests. Many of the first generation of post-colonial leaders in former French colonies had essentially been installed by the French. They spoke French, had spent time in France, and were well integrated with French elites. Jacques Foucault, a French diplomat, oversaw French relations with Africa for almost 30 years and built a huge web of client relationships with African leaders, using corruption and covert operations to make them loyal subordinates. When local political orders were threatened, the French weren't afraid to protect their hand-picked dictators. Since 1960, France has invaded Africa more than 50 times. Look at the Central African country of Gabon as one example. Gabon is particularly important to France because it has a huge supply of oil and an even bigger supply of uranium. Among the African colonies, Gabon was historically one of the very closest to France. In 1967, a man named Omar Bongo became Gabon's president, soon turning the country into a one-party dictatorship. And Bongo was intimate with France. He had been appointed after flying to Paris for what was basically a job interview with the president. So under Bongo, France and Gabon enjoyed a relationship that benefited both sets of elites. Gabon's oil was pumped by the French state-owned oil company ELF, and its uranium went right into France's arsenal of nuclear weapons. In return, France subsidized Gabon's budget, especially the parts that flowed into the pockets of Omar Bongo and his family. At one point, Bongo was worth over $130 million. Gabon, meanwhile, remained poor and underdeveloped. Under Bongo, it had one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world. Instead of investing in the Gabonese economy, Bongo spent state funds on influencing French politics in his favor, bankrolling the campaigns of central future French presidents. Even today, France keeps troops in the country to support Gabon's current ruler, who happens to be Omar Bongo's son. And somehow, Gabon is actually one of the happier stories. Other countries, like the Central African Republic, are today some of the poorest in the world, in part due to the legacies of French-backed dictators like Jean Bédel Bokassa. But there's another aspect of French influence that's even more important. Probably the most central part of all is the CFA franc, the last colonial currency still in widespread use. 
In practice, the countries that use a CFA franc have virtually no monetary sovereignty. The value of their currency is linked to the euro. The poorest countries in the world have a currency controlled by the richest countries. And so the imperatives of European countries, fiscal discipline and fighting inflation, end up shaping the very different world of Western and Central Africa. That leads to an overly tight approach to credit, something that's necessary in our current system for an economy to grow. It means that any appreciation in the euro makes exports from these countries less price competitive. So just look at what happened in Senegal. When the euro appreciated against the dollar from 2000 to 2009, the value of the CFA franc got higher. But this made local Senegalese rice more expensive than imported rice from Thailand. So Senegal, which was trying to build its own domestic rice industry, instead saw Thai rice wipe out local rice farmers. So because domestic products are expensive, this makes export-driven growth nearly impossible, which is necessary to lead a country out of poverty. That's why most countries that use a CFA franc have growth rates significantly lower than their neighbors. Because the CFA discourages the development of domestic industry, many of these economies have actually been shrinking. The Ivory Coast, the largest CFA franc country, has a real GDP per capita one third lower than it had in 1978. Other CFA franc countries like Cameroon and the Republic of the Congo reached their highest levels of real GDP per capita in the 70s and 80s. And because economic growth is weaker, there's more incentive for local elites in these countries, always tied closely to French multinationals, to take as much money out as possible. Billions of dollars have flooded out of these countries and into shell corporations and foreign bank accounts. Through massive corruption, these African elites have joined the ranks of the global super rich. In 2007, for example, Omar Bongo's daughter-in-law appeared on VH1 to buy an LA mansion for $25 million. And elites in France get a great deal too. They enjoy cheap access to natural resources and kickbacks from shady business deals. A French billionaire named Vincent Bolloré now owns most of the major ports across West Africa. In France, Bolloré is known as the quote, king of Africa. So French colonialism in Africa has never really ended. This is why academics use the term neo-colonialism. Even as the branding of empire has faded away, the structures of economic extraction have only grown stronger. This neo-colonialism is actually a much more efficient form of exploitation than the colonialism of the past. The French no longer pretend to care about building functional governments or improving local living standards. It's pure extraction, all the time. So these African countries are not underdeveloped, they're over-exploited. France is almost totally reliant on its influence in Africa for its economic power. In the words of Italy's foreign minister, if France didn't have its African colonies, because that's what they should be called, it would be the 15th largest world economy. Instead, it's among the first, exactly because of what it's doing in Africa. And the French know this. Francois Mitterrand, former president of France, said it himself. Without Africa, he declared, France will have no history in the 21st century. Today, of course, France faces competition from China within Africa and new challenges to the colonial symbolism of the CFA franc. There are plans to change the currency's name and abandon the most overt symbols of the colonial past to make it look like the system is more African than French. But France has no intention of actually abandoning a system of extraction that has made it one of the richest nations on earth. The real question is whether the next generation of Africans will allow it to continue. I'm Ismail Lutfi for the Gravel Institute. Alright, Shalom. This is the brother Bai. You're back here once again. Before I get started, like always, I want to give all praises and glory to Yahweh Bahasham, Yahweh Shah, Bahasham Rechahakwadash. Double honors to my teachers, the elder apostles of Great Millstone, and Shalom to the hopeful lit. I'm making this video because um, you still have a lot of lost Hebrew Israelites who claim to the continent of Africa. It's known as Africa today. Um, that's not its ancient name, all right? The name was known as the land of Ham, all right? Um, the ancient land of Ham, 
okay, the so-called Ethiopians, uh, you know, people you look at as Eritreans, um, you know, the ancient Egyptians that ruled ancient Egypt, um, you know, that was the name of that land, but as you can see in the video that I played prior, um, the so-called white people whose biblical nationality is um, Edom, all right, they come from the line of Esau, they are the nation of Edom, they control to this very day uh, Africa, a very great portion of Africa, um, so that's why I titled it The Beast, um, How the Beast Controls Africa, because France is a part of the beast. <laughs> Uh, the beast, what beast am I speaking of? Well, the beast in the book of Revelation, the 17th chapter, all right? Um, when you look at the ancient uh, Western Roman Empire, it was during the fall of the Roman Empire in its last days, it was broken up into 10 parts, all right? And you had those 10 ancient clans like the um, Visigoths, the Anglo-Saxons, um, the Lombards, um, so forth and so on. You look at the nations that represent uh, primarily the European Union and NATO, where you got Germany, you know, you got France, right, Greece, <clears throat> Belgium, uh, Luxembourg, all these uh, European nations, all right, that make up the beast in this current present age that we're living in. And as you can clearly see, you know, a lot of our people that live in Africa are suffering the same oppression and, under, and are under, under the same curses that we are over here in America because France controls um, the western part of Africa and a lot of the central part. But a lot of the slaves came from the western part of Africa uh, and the central part, all right, the tribe, from the tribe of Igbo, Benin, Benin the Ivory Coast, um, those were those were where they were getting uh, the slaves from to bring them over to America, primarily the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, Levi, right? Um, and even some of them were mangled in with a lot of the brothers from the uh, Northern Kingdom, all right? What you got to understand, even though Northern Kingdom and Southern Kingdom were separated, all right, during the um, expulsion from the Assyrian Empire, uh, Northern and Southern Kingdom always had remnants uh, mingled amongst, amongst each other, all right, regardless of um, the, the two kingdoms being split. We always still had remnants. Even when you look at Judea, all right, when the Lord came and you, it was primarily Judah, Benjamin, and Levi left in the land, but that doesn't mean all of Northern Kingdom was no more left in the land, all right? You still had uh, Northern Kingdom um, that didn't come over to the Americas after the Assyrian Empire. <clears throat> now, the, the main reason for, for me wanting to do this video is because you always have Israelites who, you know, they say that we're free. Um, you know, we can go back to Africa. We can do this. We can do that. Uh, we don't have to uh, have the mindset that we're slaves. Um, you know, we're free to do whatever we want to do. We can travel. Look, man, you are a slave and you need to recognize that. Jake, um, you know, they, they believe that it's a shameful thing to say that they're slaves, well, duh, of course it's shameful. That's part of your punishment for disobeying your power, all right, for breaking the covenant. It's supposed to feel shameful to recognize that you're a slave. Jake don't like calling themselves slaves. They, they want to put up this facade as if they're free, and you're not free. You're, you're, you're the furthest thing from free, all right? <clears throat> that's, why, <clears throat> that's why in that clip, um, it spoke about the leader of Guinea, Sekou Touré, wasn't with um, having any dealings with France because he would, what's the statement they said he made? He said he would rather be poor in freedom than rich in slavery. And, that, and you niggas got to confuse that just because you have some propped up celebrities that sold their souls away to the enemy, the so-called white man, for some breadcrumbs, they wanted a piece of the devil's pie so they have a couple million dollars. They got fame, but still they don't have no power. You got millions of dollars, but in whose who's currency? That's not your currency, man. That's the currency of your enslavers, the currency of your oppressors, all right? The term being poor in freedom, um, it, it, it represents, okay, you, your nation may not have much, 
but you're sovereign. All right. So you create the laws, you govern the land according to your nation, according to your people. You don't um, answer to another nation, an outside entity. All right. An enemy state. All right. So he was in the mindset of your land. You know, you may not have a lot of resources, um, you know, and, and people not doing uh, trade deals with you. All right. Because you don't want to succumb to their ways. So you're poor, but you're free. All right. You're not subject to their currency, which, look, man, the so-called white man has his hand in everything on this whole earth because the Mosai has set him up to be the ruler of the planet Earth, all right? And when the Lord gets ready to take him down, that's when the kingdom of heaven is going to get set up. But you you simple niggas, you got to realize just because you're able to work a job and, and fly on a plane, and that doesn't make you free. That, that has nothing to do with freedom. That has nothing to do with sovereignty. All right, that has nothing to do with power. You own no industries. All right, the car, the very car you drive to make your money, is owned by their companies, their industries, their factories. All right, you got to get a license for damn near everything. You got to pay their property taxes. All right, you got to get a passport. Look, you're under their uh, rules. You're under their jurisdictions. All right, you're governed by them. Regardless if they put somebody with melanin in a in a in a Senate seat or a governor's seat or a city council seat, if they want their person removed, they can remove them because they control the whole power structure. They're they're at the top of the whole system. All right? And you can't Jake sometimes has that mind well, a lot of the times they have the mindset is that they can somehow or that spook by the door, spook that set by the door spirit, they can get in and then overthrow from the inside out. You can't overthrow uh, this man's system, man. All right? You can't overcome him and you're still um, using his currency. How the fuck can you um, overthrow this man and he and with using his own currency? You're building things. You can't even buy seeds for your farm without his currency. All right? You can't even get certain plots of land or cattle without a certain license and his 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 go ahead so you, you you the first thing you have to recognize is yes you are a slave that's what the lord wants jake to recognize your faults and repent what do, what does scripture teach us over here in second chronicles let's go to the book of second chronicles <clears throat> the um the the um what seven seven chapter second chronicles chapter 7 Verse, mm, uh, <clears throat> let's read verse 14. This is a uh, second Chronicles chapter seven, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, all right, the first, the head tribe of the nation of Jerusalem is what, uh, Yehudah, right? All right. So like, I mean, the first tribe of the nation of Yahshua Allah is Yehudah, Judah. Yahweh has the Most High's name Yahweh in it, right? So look, it says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, humility, which is humiliation, right? Shame. You get on your knees, you bow your head, right? In the ancient time, we used to throw the dust upon our, on the top of our head for shame, all right? That we brought upon ourselves. It says it. Continue reading. It says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So the Lord has the power to heal our, heal our land and make us sovereign. Right? Where is our land? Jerusalem. All right? Jerusalem. Hey, the scriptures say what? Uh, Jerusalem is the mother of us all, not Africa. Right? And for and for any of you niggas saying that Africa is the motherland, well, we can prove you in this prove to you in the scriptures why why heathens are trotting down Jerusalem right now. Can you show us in any of your beliefs why France and the Europe nations have control over Africa and now the Moabites, the Chinese, right? That's who the Moabites are, the biblical Moabites, the Chinese. Why the Chinese are now in Africa? Can you show us? Can your uh, Egyptian gods and Kemet gods put and nut show us why y'all can't get over the fact that your enemies have control over your land if that's the motherland? 
That's not no damn motherland, right? The Holy Land is where everything started at, okay? Known as Mesopotamia, right? Where the Tigris River is, all right? Where the, where the Red Sea is, where the Nile River is, right? Where the Euphrates is, all right? And where, where it's all going to end, too, during the war war of what? Hamagadwan, all right? Yahweh, the, the Valley of the Lord's Decision, Yahweh Shapat, which is known as the Middle East, right? We can show you why um, we can't enter into that land right now. We're under curses. We recognize our shame. We recognize our fault. Y'all can't do that when it comes to Africa. Show us why y'all can't go to Africa and make Africa into fucking Wakanda. Since y'all don't want to believe the, the, the truth, you don't have the answers, Right? One one key thing that the uh, video showed you was how uh, France gave them the illusion, all right, these colonies in Africa, these places in Africa, the illusion that they have independence, right? They say we can we'll give them the image of independence, but we're gonna they're gonna have to use our currency. We're gonna have to have troops in in their lands, our troops in their lands, and we're gonna control their resources. Well, motherfucker, you a slave. But to the outside world, you have independence. That's not independence. <laughs> if they control your resource, resources, your currency, and they and they got troops in your land, the moment you act up, they can make you poor, and they can fucking just destroy you by the army, by their army. That sounds like the same situation we're in over here in America. We use their currency, they control the resources, and their troops are all around us. And you got the odd, bugged out, lost people that have joined their military. And follow the follow their uh, orders to come against their own people. So miss us with this, or you're free. And, you know, go back to Africa and all this dumb shit y'all be talking about. The first thing y'all need to do is repent to Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shai. Right? Recognize your fault. Recognize your sin. And, and when you do that, when you recognize that, and you you know you you um put on humility and humiliation. And you feel the shame the Lord wants you to feel, right? It's just like the black woman. She don't want to feel shameful that she's bald-headed. Well, that's a curse that the Lord put on you. Instead of covering it up with a fucking wig, you should recognize your fault, recognize your shame, learn where you went wrong, and stop putting on a wig and yelling at men. All right? That's how, that's how we as men should be with our power, recognizing our shame. And stop trying to think that we can do things on our own and you usurp, usurp authority over our creator and overcome our enemy through carnal means when our enemy controls everything that we use on a daily basis. It's not going to happen that way. But when we repent and recognize our wrongdoings, this is what the Lord says he's going to do. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 61, right? And let's go to, um, let's go to verse, uh, verse 7. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 7. For your shame... Ye shall have double, and for your confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. The double, ever, everlasting joy shall be unto them. So, after we recognize our faults and we repent, and the Lord finally shows us mercy and grace and brings unto us salvation and deliverance, then for our shame, we shall have glory. Right? The Lord's going to put our shame away from us, and then we're going to enter into our land the true motherland, which is Jerusalem, all right? So I just want to do a lesson touching on that. Uh, you got to keep bringing awareness to Jake how how much of a dire, dire situation they're in, we're in as a nation, and why we need Yahweh Shah Hamashiach, all right, the Savior. Lord willing, this was edifying. Until the next time I say, Shalom.